Hi everyone, my name is Mace Vaughn. I'm the Pollinator Conservation and Program Co-Director here at the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. And for this module, we're gonna be talking about giving you all an overview of the natural history of pollinators, like butterflies and bees. So here's our introduction for you to pollinators, and I hope that you enjoy it. Um, so first, let's start off. Like if you're out there working with people, trying to help people understand the value, the importance of pollinators. I think fundamentally it's critical to know that um, you know, they are the backbone of flower reproduction. So 85% of flowering plants need an animal. Mostly we're talking about insects. In fact, if we're in North America, we're mostly talking about bees to move pollen from one flower to the next or one part of the flower to the next to facilitate that movement of pollen which then leads to seed and fruit production and then the reproduction of those plants. So as such, pollinators really are an ecological keystone. Um, so if we don't have pollinators, we're really, our plant communities and are really suffering, as are we for that matter, as you already know. If we look specifically at food that we eat, Pollinators provide an ecosystem service that enables plants and, and plants to produce fruits and seeds that result in, this is 35% of crop production worldwide. If we look at how much farmers are getting paid for this production, that's 18 to $27 billion worth of crops in the United States every year, $217 billion worldwide. Um, if you think about it, this is just the money that's getting paid to farmers. You know, these berries, these apples, um, you know, the lettuce and the melons and the squash. All this, when it goes into production, you know, all those berries are getting turned into jams and desserts. Um, they get moved through the system. And so this is just really the tip of the iceberg economically as this fresh produce moves to the market in terms of what its actual value is. Now, a lot of people have talked about, well, some people have said fallaciously that if we lost our pollinators, we'd all be dead in one or two years. Well, that's not true. Um, our diets would just be really boring and we'd probably all get scurvy. Um, uh, if we look, well, we wouldn't, there are some other ways around that, but that's not for this presentation. If we look, most of our vitamins and minerals actually come from insect pollinated crops. So again, fruits and vegetables, which ultimately trace their way back um, to needing a pollinator, provide all these vitamins and minerals. If we lost all of our pollinators, we'd have corn and wheat and rice, all these wind pollinated crops. So we'd have calories, but those are calories that do not have nearly the nutrients, the vitamins and minerals that fruits and vegetables have. And finally, if we think about this importance, scientists have estimated that one in three mouthfuls of food and drink that we consume traces its way back to a pollinator. And I used to think this was ridiculous, like how many apples, how many blueberries, how many cucumbers and melons do we actually eat? Um, and you know, how much of our diet does that continue, contain? However, there is all those, but there's also things like you know, cauliflower or lettuce or onions or carrots, which don't require a pollinator pr to produce the vegetable, but in order to have the seed, in order to grow these vegetables, more often than not, you need a pollinator. Also, all of the oils that we use, sunflower oil, canola oil, um, safflower oil, um, these are all plants that need a pollinator. And probably most importantly, when it comes to thinking about this one in three mouthfuls of food, that we eat, dairy and meat come from livestock that are fed alfalfa. In order to have alfalfa hay, you need to have an alfalfa hay field and to plant that field you need alfalfa seed and to produce alfalfa seed or other forage legumes like clovers and whatnot you need a pollinator. So all of a sudden, once we start looking at a percentage of meat and dairy, if we look at oils, if we look at all the fruit and vegetables that need seed production, um, all of a sudden it starts making a lot of sense that maybe this one in three mouthfuls of food that we and drink that we consume, maybe that's even an underestimate. And to illustrate this, we worked with Whole Foods Market, oh my goodness, several years ago now, a store in Providence, Rhode Island, where we collaborated with the folks at the store to come in in the middle of the night, take a, put a bunch of shoppers around in the produce department, and then take a picture from up on a ladder. We then took everybody out, and then we removed all the produce in the produce department that is insect dependent, 
and then voila, you see, what do we have here? The apples go away, um, a, a bit of the citrus goes away, all the guacamole and avocados go away, all the berries go away, a lot of the lettuce and onions and cauliflower and broccoli go away. So you can see we lose all this produce when we lose our pollinators. We also did the same experiment in the dairy department, taking away a percentage of all these yogurts that have berries in them um, and a percentage of the yogurt based on how much alfalfa and you know, sort of the percentage that's dependent upon the, the, the actual dairy itself. And you can see here, again, we're losing, you know, more than two, like more than a half, certainly almost two thirds of all of the uh, food in this dairy aisle that it had, um, that had insect dependent uh, pr produce as part of it. So <clears throat> that's the human diet. It's also important to think about the value and the importance of pollinators for wildlife and wild ecosystems. So the fruits and seeds that are actually produced as a result of pollination are part of the diet of all sorts of birds and mammals. You, know, you can think about this every time you see a songbird feeding on sunflowers and, and thistle seeds and things like that. Pollinators themselves are actually food for wildlife. In fact, invertebrates, the animals that we're trying to cultivate, whether it's in your backyard, on your farm, in your park, whatever, those invertebrates, which include our pollinators, are food for 89% of birds during at least one of those birds' life stages. So if you want to have songbirds, game birds, all of those chicks are being fed insects. And the more insects we can produce in a landscape, if we can manage a landscape for pollinator diversity, <clears throat> we'll be able to have those insects that are important for all sorts of wildlife. And in that same kind of context, pollinator habitat is really compatible with the needs of other wildlife. If we build high quality pollinator and beneficial insect habitat with a diversity of native plants, bloom throughout the growing season, we're really creating a diverse ecosystem that supports all of this wildlife. So really it's a useful framework, whether it's your backyard or a farm, for building a really interesting habitat that's good not just for pollinators, but for wildlife in general. So when we think about pollinators, um, <clears throat> there are a whole suite of different insect pollinators that come immediately to mind and that are all arguably pollinators. You've got butterflies, you've got flies, you've got moths, you've got wasps and beetles and bees. All of these are pollinators, but really bees, bees are the, are the animals we're going to focus on most. We'll talk a little bit about butterflies later on. But bees are our most important pollinators, and they are our most important pollinators for really three primary reasons. First of all, they have these three distinct, they, well, they have these three distinct behaviors, these three distinct traits. They collect and transport pollen. So if we go back to this slide and we look, butterflies, you know, butterflies collect um, nectar, they're feeding on nectar, a little bit of pollen. Flies, they eat a little bit of pollen, but they're mostly feeding on nectar. Moths, mostly nectar. Wasps, mostly nectar. Beetles, a kind of a mix of nectar and pollen, but they're just kind of eating it all as opposed to carrying it around. It's really bees that uniquely are collecting pollen. They go out to that flower and they want to get as much as they can. And this is because unlike all of those other insects, Bees are actually collecting pollen to feed to their young, to develop, to grow their offspring. So they are very dependent on both the pollen and the nectar in a flower. So therefore, they're getting in there and getting it all out to get out there. Second, they forage in the area around a nest. So if we create a landscape um, that has bee nest sites in it, which I'll talk about more later, they're going to stay in that area. They're going to pollinate the plants in that area. I mean, it's, this is most obvious in the case of, say, honeybees, where you plop a honeybee hive down and unless they're swarming and reproducing, they're going to stay in that hive and forage in the area around that hive. So if we're trying to kind of manage for pollination in an area, if we can create nest sites or get hives out there, in the case of honeybees, they're going to stay there and pollinate in that landscape. And third, and perhaps even, well, yeah, third and really importantly, they have this cool behavior called flower constancy. Now, even though bees, whatnot, you know, they've got brains the size of a sesame seed or a poppy seed, depending on the species. I mean, these are not the sharpest tools in the shed. They are able to learn. Like, these are animals that are not dumb. They can go out and learn what they need to learn to be most efficient in the world. So if they get to a flower and figure out how to get the pollen out of it, how to get the nectar out of it, they're going to keep trying to go to that same flower. If they know that flower is working and they know how to get the pollen and nectar out, they will learn this behavior 
And therefore, they will exhibit this behavior called flower constancy where they'll visit the same species of flower over and over and over again. So what this means is that the pollen is moving to the right flower. Like the pollen doesn't like it if it goes from a rose to a sunflower. That doesn't help anybody out. But if they go from a rose to a rose to a rose to a rose or a squash to a squash to a squash to a squash, boom. Now we're getting um, the right pollen moving to the right flower and pollination happening. So because of these traits, bees are where it's at. Now if we think about pollen and we think about bees and how they're carrying around, like so much of our used to the honey, so much of us are used to the honeybee, which has that big, you know, those pollen baskets like we see here also in bumblebees. <clears throat> so some of our bees carry this pollen wet, which is a very efficient way to hold it all on, to hold it all together. <coughs> Pardon me. So efficient, in fact, that sometimes it's even hard to kind of move around, like it doesn't get released to the next flower as well. But some of them will carry that. You'll see a wet lump all packed together in the pollen basket, otherwise known as the corbicula, on their rear legs. But most of our native bees actually carry their pollen dry as sort of dry pollen on hairs on what's called a pollen brush or the scopa on their legs. Um, some of them as a, I don't know if, I don't think we'll have a slide on this later. Some of them actually carry their pollen in dry hairs on their bellies, like our mason bees and our leaf cutter bees. If you look at them closely, when they come back to their nests, they will just have big bundles of white or orange or yellow or blue pollen packed right on their bellies. So they're moving it all around and carrying it in different ways. Now when most people think of a bee, most people, as I suggested a few minutes ago, moments ago, think of honeybees. You know, they think of a beehive and they think of wax honeycomb, um, but you know, honeybees are pretty unique and pretty different. You might also think of, you know, what you see in books and they're big, happy, buzzy things flying around. Um, or you, a lot of people mistake wasps for bees. You know, this yellow jacket, people talk about, oh, I had all these bees on my dinner, or I got stung by this bee, when in fact we're talking about yellow jackets. These are not bees. Um, well, I take that back. I mean, well, that's not a bee. I don't even know what that is. I mean, honeybees are bees. That's art. Um, you know, here's a wasp. That's not a bee. Um, but uh, where's my point here? I think my point here is that it's important to understand what a bee is and to get a sense of sort of what's out there in the landscape. And as I mentioned, honeybees are not typical. Like our native bees, which we're really going to focus on a lot here, mostly do not have thousands of workers in a hive. They do not have a hive that lasts throughout the year. They're usually annual or even only active for a few weeks at a time. Um, yeah, honeybees are really quite different. So we're going to talk a lot about here our native bees in a few moments. Um, so the here, let's talk about honeybees though for a little bit. So European honeybees, they were introduced into North America in the 16, early 1620s. Um, they were brought over from Europe. Some, some have come in indirectly from South America and from Africa over the last several years. Um, and they're hugely important for crop pollination. Um, and so these are really important bees. And if we can support them in a landscape, that's great. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to do that. Um, and in fact, it's really important to know that the beekeeping industry is on hard times. I mean, beekeepers are still losing 27 to 43% of their hives every year. I mean, they're really a canary in the coal mine, arguably, for pollinators, um, you know, for the problems that are affecting pollinators. And if we look at honeybees, they're afflicted by diseases, by pests, insecticides, poor nutrition, you know, poor forage in the landscape, which we'll talk about a lot. Um, we've seen a lot of, of Beekeepers go out of business because of low honey prices. Just the fact that they're losing so many hives a year just making it really, really hard. Um, but interesting, like right in 2017, there are 2.9 million managed hives in the US. And they're really, you know, they're used a lot, particularly these days, for crop pollination. Now, if you want to help honeybees, um, or even just help bees in general, it's important to understand that beekeeping is a hobby. It's not conservation of pollinators or conservation of bees. Frankly, it's a ton of fun. Like I got my start in all of this 25, yeah, maybe almost 30 years ago now as a beekeeper who noticed the amazing diversity of other insects that are out there in the flowers and I got totally sucked into all these native animals. Um, but I still think, you know, keeping honeybees is fun. 
but that's really what it is. Like if you want to keep honeybees, you should do it if you want to do it just because you think it'd be fun, because they're a fascinating animal, or you want to produce your own honey, because frankly it's delicious and it's a really fun thing to do. But you know, in the same way that if you want to conserve songbirds or game birds, you don't keep chickens. If you want to protect and conserve uh, pollinators, you know, you don't keep honeybees. However, if we can create neighborhoods, parks, gardens, farms, whole landscapes that are really designed to provide a ton of food a ton of pollen and nectar for native bees and honeybees, you'll be helping all those local beekeepers and yeah, all those other honeybees in the landscape. So anyway, just an important point to keep in mind when thinking about bee and pollinator conservation. So what about our native bees? So what about the diversity that's out there? So we've got this one European honeybee that so many people know about that is really important, but there are 3,600 species of native bees in the US and Canada. It's a lot of different species. If you look at Oregon, we've got maybe 600 to 800 depending. If you're in the Portland metropolitan area where I am today, maybe there's 100 species. I think even this number is probably a little bit high. It's probably, get, it's, I think we're looking at maybe fewer than 100, but let's say about 100 species in the Portland down through the Willamette Valley of Oregon. So there's a ton of diversity that's out there. <clears throat> and you know, if we look at all this, we've got digger bees and carpenter bees, small carpenter bees, cuckoo bees that attack other bee nests, cellophane bees, mass bees, green sweat bees, sweat bees, leaf cutter bees, mason bees, carter bees, uh, mining bees, uh, the bumblebees. Um, I mean, there are a whole, so, like there are all sorts of different kind of bees. I could add into this uh, longhorn bees and sunflower bees and digger bees. Um, I mean, there's just a tremendous diversity of species. Um, but fundamentally, if we think about it, if for you to understand kind of what you can do or what um, we need to be doing around our homes and our parks and our farms, etc., really fundamentally, there are just three types of native bees that you need to think about. So ecologically, if of all these species, let me go back, of all these different species that are out there, you don't need to know all these different names, although eventually if you want to learn them all, it's totally cool and it's actually really interesting. But fundamentally, if you understand that there are solitary ground nesting bees, solitary tunnel nesting bees, and social bumblebees, and if you understand the ecological needs, the habitat needs of these three sort of broad groups, you really be able to work in your own backyard to kind of make sure that those habitat components are there so you could be supporting all of those bees that we talked about. So first, fundamentally, it's important to understand just the basic life cycle of a solitary bee. Remember, two of these groups, the tunnel nesting and the ground nesting bees, are basically solitary species. And what that means is you've got individual bees, an individual female bee, all by herself, who's going and doing the whole work of producing the next generation. So what she will do, just as an example, is she and male bees will come out of the ground or come out of their tunnels. In the case of this mining bee, maybe that's in the spring, early springtime, they'll mate and then the males just go off and do whatever. Um, yeah, they're not as nearly as important as the female bees. Those female bees will then go about making a nest. So in the case of a ground nesting bee, which I'll talk about more, pardon me, they'll dig a tunnel underground make this nice hole, this capsule, this cell underground, line it with a nice waxy secretion, and then start foraging for pollen and nectar to bring back and to create a little ball, a little ball of pollen and nectar. She'll lay an egg on that, that egg will hatch and start to grow and eat that whole thing and molt a whole bunch of times. And then underground, several weeks, several weeks later, will pupate, <coughs> pardon me, will pupate underground and then be ready to come out again next year. So in the case of a lot of these bees, they only have a single generation per year. So maybe the adults are active for four to eight weeks, they're flying around, they're doing all this. Maybe they leave behind, you know, 10, 15, 20 offspring, in this case underground, to come out again the next year. So if we look at our ground nesting bees, these are roughly 70% of native bee species nest underground, and they just look like anthills maybe. Um, they're frequently in sandier soils, um, which are well drained. Uh, they love southern slopes. Like if you've got a south facing slope, look carefully there because you'll frequently, it's a little bit warmer, a little bit drier. Um, they like some access to bare ground. Some of them, if we look on this next slide, really like bare ground, but others you can find even in sparse lawns. And each species 
species has a different architecture, a different nest architecture when you look at it underground. You know, some of them it's just a single tunnel with little offshoots. Others it's like this whole rooted system. There are some that dig a central tunnel and then have cells spiraling around that tunnel. Um, ah, it's all, there's all sorts of different varieties in terms of how they do this underground. And if you look at it, you know, like it might be in a lawn like that mining bee, um, you might have, it might be bare ground, like these two species, like, like I said, they can look like ant nests, ant nests, they usually need some sort of bare ground to be able to see them. And sometimes they can be incredibly abundant. So my, I actually live across the street from Saban Elementary School, and when my daughter started to go here years ago, this is a school in northeastern, uh, northeast Portland, Oregon, all the parents when they found out what I did were like, oh, have you heard about the tickle bees? And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and then one day I was working at home in March around St. Patrick's Day. And I look out from my dining room window and there are all these kids on the ground on their hands and their knees and they're grabbing stuff out of the air and throwing things at each other. And then I knew, oh, the tickle bees. So I went across the street and in this field I started noticing all these little mounds, tens of thousands of little mounds. And I looked more closely and saw this freshly dug dirt and waited around a few minutes and buzzing all over the place were tens of thousands of mining bees really, but the kids name them the tickle bees. The kids have adopted these bees and they're super cute and they don't sting and they grab them, throw them at each other. And all of a sudden, like all these kids who are out here playing in the field, now I understood these are the tickle bees. So some of these ground nesting solitary bees can be incredibly abundant. Sometimes you'll see them in schools and fields and ballparks and whatnot. Um, and you know, they're actually, they don't sting, hence they're called the tickle bees or the kids name them that. And yeah, they're just, they're pretty fun and they're pretty cool and it's a pretty interesting thing. So ground nesting bees can be really abundant. They're all over the place. They're our most, our biggest group of species of native bee that's out there. Then we've got the tunnel nesting solitary bees. So these are the ones that a lot of people know about, mason bees or leaf cutter bees they've heard about. Garden stores more and more have got these tubes you can get for mason bees. So this is roughly 30% of our native species. They're gonna nest in some sort of a hollow or pithy plant stem, uh, maybe old beetle tunnels in wood. Um, in some cases, man-made cavities or even old snail shells in different parts of the country. Um, within those tunnels, they're gonna separate, you know, just like that ground nesting bee made those cells underground. In this case, each of these bees is separating those cells by leaf pieces or mud or sawdust in the case of this, oop, here you go, right there's a nice wall. Sawdust in the case of small carpenter bees, um, plant fibers, resins, all sorts of different things that they'll do to basically separate the cells in the nest. And I'll show you a picture here, oh, right now. So take a mason bee, for example, they'll put the mud wall there, that ball of pollen and nectar, they will gather, lay that egg on it, and then you know, continue to do this. You'll see in the case of the mason bee, this one, this one, this one, this one, these are all bigger, and then the cells get smaller, so these are all male bees. Because the male bees, if like a bird comes along and goes pa-ping, or a parasite comes in and nails the end of this, you lose a couple of male bees, no big deal. The female bees are the really the big investment and the ones you really want to protect. So they'll grow and develop in there just like those ground nesting solitary species. And eventually you'll end up with all these cocoons. You can see here inside as they're pupating from the larva to the pupa to the adult. Um, all this is happening, you know, in tunnels like these here. Like here's an example of, that's pretty common that people have, um, or some people like to drill holes and blocks of wood. Um, you know, you want these to be, well, we'll go into details later, but ideally these are like five inches deep. So you've got lots of space for female bees. Cause if it's too short, you'll just have an empty space and some males and maybe one female so you want to, you know, several inches deep, a good six, ideally six inches deep for mason bees, and you'll get a lot of female bees, which is what you want. So like I said, some of them will use leaf pieces or mud to, to, for their nests. You can do things like create bee houses, um, you know, like, like we're looking at here, um, stem bundles like this, plant trees and shrubs that have hollow stems into which those bees will, will burrow. Um, just anything we can do to kind of get that sort of habitat out there. I like with elderberry, I frequently go around and if I'm gonna come back to a place to teach a lot, I'll cut the ends of elderberry stems off just to open them up so that bees could go into them. So if you can conserve those snags, brush piles, plant pithy stem shrubs, all those sorts of things will create potential nesting sites for those solitary tunnel nesting bees. Now we come to bumblebees. <coughs> so bumblebees, <coughs> pardon me, 
Bumblebees are probably some of our most important native bee pollinators. There are about 57 species. About, that's hilarious. There are 57 species in North America. These are social bees. So more similar to honeybees, we have a queen now who's actually helping to start and raise a colony with you know maybe dozens to hundreds of workers. In this case, you've got, these are colonies founded by a single queen. They only last for one season. So very different from honeybees that are perennial. Ideally they last you know year round, although we see that less and less, but that's another story. These colonies only last for a season and may contain 100, 300, 400 in some cases workers, mostly just a couple hundred workers at their peak. So what happens is that in the winter time, right, you know, which is, happens to be when we are right now, you've got bumblebee queens that are overwintering that are hibernating like little bears underground. They find some ideally dry, soft, organic you know, matter to dig their way into. They burrow down where they're kind of protected from the elements and then they just wait out the winter. Um, in the spring, they come out and they're going to find some sort of an old rodent burrow or a small cavity that's going to be a good nest. Hopefully that's close to willows or maple trees or, I don't know, Oregon grape. Some sort of early flowering, pollen bearing plant because those queens, once they find that cavity and start to kind of you know, get things set up, they're going to pick a couple of pots of wax. They're going to go out. She's going to go out and try to find the closest, most abundant source of pollen and nectar, forage and bring that back, which is pretty dangerous work in the springtime. Lay some eggs and then she's just hunkering down like a chicken, Ooh, generating some heat. It's 92, 93 degrees in there. She's like making these eggs grow, hatch and then grow as fast as they can because she wants to get the first workers out the door so she can stay inside where it's safe and just keep laying eggs and keep helping to grow the colony. As the season goes on, you know, more and more workers are produced until we hit sort of the end of the season where we, the colony switches and starts making males, drone bees, and new queens. They kick those bees out at the end of the season. They'll mate. Those poor male bees will just, you see them in the sunflowers in the fall or on the goldenrod. You know, they've got no place to go and they're just waiting for the first frost to get them. The old queen dies and that new queen, she's now mated. Hopefully she's fattened up like a lot of goldenrod, a lot of aster, a lot of sunflower, something to get her good and fat so she can find that place to overwinter, hunker down for the season and uh, yeah, be ready to go for the next year. So that's the basic life cycle of a bumblebee colony. Um, and so, like I said, you know, their habitat needs, they need those abandoned rodent burrows or lodged grasses or little cavities or just any sort of brush piles and unmowed areas, things that are kind of ragged and overgrown where they can find warm, dry spaces in which to start these colonies that you can see here. So we might look for, so if we're trying to think about how to manage for them, you know, we don't want to tidy everything up. We want to have some areas with long grass that's overgrown, that's not disturbed or tilled or mowed or burned so that you've got a place where they could go in. It's also important to remember that, you know, they need places to overwinter. Um, they need places to shelter. And actually, that talks about winter shelter for butterflies, but I'll come back to that. So we've got to have some sort of a place. Often it's just in a wood edge where there's a duff layer, where there's a thick mat of organic leaves or pine needles or spruce needles, something where these bees can easily dig down to get in under a blanket, basically, so they can be nice and warm and dry. And then if we think about it, when we have these sort of overgrown kind of undisturbed areas, each Year, those are also places where a lot of our butterflies and other beneficial insects can hunker down for the winter as well. Untidy areas, very important. In fact, I like to joke, like if you need an excuse to have some part of your yard, garden, farm, park, or whatever, that's just a little rangy, a little crazy, a little piled up debris, I'm here to give you that excuse. All right, so if we're trying to think, <coughs> pardon me, one moment. Mm-hmm. How's our time? Eight minutes. All right, we're, we might be able to pull it off. So, if you're thinking about how to create habitat, we've talked about all these different nesting needs, and so that's really important. Tunnel nests, ground nests, overgrown areas where you might have rodents. You know, if you want to put out an owl box to like attract owls to eat rodents, and in so doing, open up some rodent nests, hey, power to you, could be great. But so much of what we're doing when we're trying to create good pollinator habitat is making sure we've got 
plant species that are providing abundant sources of pollen and nectar. Um, so, you know, in thinking about bees, some of our bees, like bumblebees, they just, they'll collect pollen, they'll collect nectar from any plant. In fact, most bees will collect nectar from kind of any plant they can find. Some of our bees are pretty particular about where they'll collect pollen. So for example, it's actually a reason I really like it when people plant sunflowers. There are a lot of bees that specialize just on sunflowers, which makes it pretty cool. You put that out and you're gonna attract things, attract bees like longhorn bees and, and digger bees and sunflower bees that wouldn't go, that don't go to any, you know, almost any other plant species. So one thing that's fun to do is to, to learn what are those plant species that attract what we call specialist bees, bees that specialize in a particular species or genus or just group of plants. Anyway, so you want to have abundant pollen and nectar sources out there. Ooh, look at that. That's nice. So um, and you need to have the right type of flower. That's important. So it's important to look at resources, you know, that Xerxes has got or other plant lists that other partners and collaborators out there across the country helping us to understand like what are those plant species that when you plant them you can walk out in the garden and be like, wow, look at all these bees or butterflies or wasps or whatever it might be. But basically if you're trying to enter into this, you know, you could think about like what flower patches do I already have? I mean something that I tell a lot of people just to do like an initial start into say pollinator conservation is just when you're walking in the neighborhood, you're walking the dog or just for yourself or you're going for a run, just when things come into flower, look to see what's blooming and what's attracting insects like bees and butterflies and whatnot. Um, if you go to the nursery, like frequently I'll go to a nursery and if they've got flowers out there, you can see there are a lot of flowers that do not attract pollinators. I'll show you an example here in a second. Um, but you go to that nursery, you can see, oh look, all those penstemons, they're all full of bees. Like, oh my God, I gotta get penstemon. Let's put that out there. Um, so, you know, we can look for and protect those existing flower patches or we can create new patches, which kind of frankly is what we're hoping everyone will do. So when we're trying to create this forage, you want to think about plants that provide abundant pollen and nectar. Those, like I just said, that are preferred by pollinators. We want to have bloom throughout the year from willows and let's say Oregon grape to lupins and berries to uh, milkweed and native thistles. Native thistles are phenomenal and not a weed. Like these are, oh, don't get me started. Thistles are great. Goldenrod and aster. Um, we want to have this bloom from early in the season to the middle of the season to the end of the year into the fall to be able to feed bees and butterflies and other pollinators throughout the whole growing season. Um, if we're in a home garden, it's really useful to create more blocks of flowers. If you think about it, you got this bee, it's flying across the landscape or a butterfly. Um, if there's a block of flowers, two, three, f four feet across, it's much more attractive. At least there's some research from California that shows that those blocks of wildflowers attract more pollinators than if you've just got a single plant here or there or just small plants. So that can help in garden design. I wouldn't stress about this if you're working in a natural area or something, but if you're designing a garden, it's really, um, yeah, can be useful to kind of create blocks of colors. Plus it's just prettier if you're designing something, a nice block of color is more, uh, stands out, it's more attractive. Um, and then for so many of our plants, you know, for pollinators in particular, like native species are gonna overall give you more bang for your buck. Uh, they're better adapted to your local environment. They take less water, less care. Um, there are more specialists, particularly say butterflies and moths and caterpillars and beetles and things like that that are gonna feed on it. So you're just gonna be supporting more insects. Um, but that's not to say I'm totally opposed to using non-native plants. Um, nah, that's not real, I'll come back in a second. Some non-native plants are just great for the garden. They're easy to work with. Um, and can be an important part of the picture. So I like to lean as much as I can on native species and to be learning about what native species are sort of out there and can be doing the job and are beautiful and support this broader range of critters. Um, but if you've got some non-native favorites, hey, go for it. Like it's especially in a, in a garden environment, have a good time. Like I think that's great. <clears throat> But you know, it's important, like I said, to recognize that not all plant species are great. So I always forget. I think these are pansies. See, I don't even know these things. Garden varieties, these might look pretty, but they don't offer any pollen or nectar. Like they are worthless for bees. I mean, I, some people think they're pretty. I personally don't, but don't hold it against me. Um, so like I said, like if we've got some non-native species like lavenders or cosmos or different non-native ornamental sedums, these garden varieties can look pretty and provide a whole bunch of pollen and nectar. In fact, if you've got French and English lavender, boom, you've got six to eight weeks of pollen and nectar right there. So again, watch those flowers in your neighborhood and yard and see what's out there and see what's good.
Um, if you're thinking about where to create habitat, I mean, ideally you create this beautiful native landscape and etc. But even so many people like a lawn, and if you want to just have some clover in that lawn or some other things, that actually does a lot. I mean, that's providing a lot of resources. So lawns are a place that can both provide that lawn function, um, but also could have some pollinator benefit. A lot of people these days are thinking about how to take their front yard and turn it into an urban meadow and bringing native wildflowers in. Um, if you're going to do this, you know, you're worried about the neighbors, here's my advice. Basically do it, mow an edge on it, plant some grass, stick a sign on it, boom. Who's going to complain? They're like, oh, it's on purpose. Here's this beautiful little meadow with a nice edge and a sign. I see what's going on. You can communicate to your neighbors what's going on. You've got the edge. I don't know. Don't, that's, it's worked pretty well in a lot of places. Um, I've got friends who I've helped put in facilia and all sorts of cool plants in, what do they call it, the hell strip and these sidewalk strips along the street. You know, a place that is hard to figure out what to do with. And as long as you got a place to park your car, you could have all this forage right there along the street and uh, could be just humming and buzzing away. Um, so those are just some ideas in an urban landscape where you could have let me go back. Some areas in the urban landscape, you know, besides just your formal garden, where you could have uh, bring wildflowers in and all that kind of good stuff. In the last two se sections, we talked, focused mostly on native bees and native bee um, habitat needs, biology, all that kind of good stuff to help you think about how to meet their needs. But so many of us are interested in pollinator conservation and pollinators um, because of butterflies. And so it's important also to think about how when we do pollinator work in our neighborhoods or farms or wherever, that we can also think about the needs of butterflies. I'm not going to go into great detail on this because there's so much information out there about butterf butterflies, but I did want to point out some of the major differences between native bees and butterflies so we could think about them when thinking about creating habitats in our communities. And the really, the, one of the biggest differences um, are that bees are in need of nesting resources, so places to nest. And we talked about tunnel nests solid for solitary tunnel nesting bees and ground nests for ground nesting bees and small cavities, you know, little, little areas for bumblebees. Um, you know, bees need these nests because they put so much care and time into taking care of their young and raising their young. Butterflies, in contrast, frankly, don't spend a lot of time taking care of their offspring. They are looking for host plants. So the female butterfly, all the work that she is doing is trying to make sure she can find the appropriate host plant that her caterpillars, her eggs will hatch into caterpillars and what they'll feed on that'll help them, well, that'll feed them so they can grow into adults. That is, the, that is all the care that she is putting into those critters. So fundamentally, when thinking about creating habitat for bees and butterflies, besides all the forage we've talked about, all those pollen and nectar sources, um, for, if we're gonna think about butterflies, we wanna think about host plants. So for example, milkweed for the monarch butterfly is probably the most common example that people think about, where you've got a very specific group of plants, all those milkweeds, that um, monarch butterfly c caterpillars need to feed on in order to grow into adults. So if we think too then just about the basic life cycle, um, you know, you've got the adult butterfly, she's going to lay eggs like these, uh, I think those are Taylor Checker Spot, onto the appropriate host plant. They're going to hatch and grow into these caterpillars that are going to bigger and bigger and bigger as they feed on the host plants and then eventually pupating and turning into adults where once again you're going to need those nectar plants. So host plants for caterpillars, uh, which varies by species and this is why as we'll talk about again and again we Native plants are preferred because native plants more frequently are host plants for our native butterflies. And then obviously all these nectar sources for adults. Another important habitat component to think about with butterflies are overwintering sites. Um, to a certain degree, we talked about this in many ways, um, thinking about queen bumblebees that need that sort of duff layer to dig underneath in order to overwinter. Butterflies similarly need some protected place um, in order, you know, where they spend, you know, those cold, wet, sometimes very cold, sometimes very wet months. Um, and they can be doing this in many different life stages. Sometimes some species overwinter as eggs, others as caterpillars or pupa, some as adults. So it's just important to think about how can we have places that are overgrown, not disturbed, 
you know, in some cases a duff layer or some loose vegetation to crawl underneath. Sometimes it's getting back into the shrubbery where they may be pup pupating on branches and we want to minimize, you know, disturbance to those areas. So this is where like in a park, a home, a garden, having those wild places, those edges that are kind of overgrown and undisturbed um, is an important part of just thinking about the overall habitat needs of all pollinators, bees and butterflies and other species as well. All right, so wrapping up this section, <clears throat> one of the things that, of course, you know, we get most excited about here at Xerces is helping people think about sort of in more con even more concrete ways, you know, what can we do? Like, how is it that we can really get out there and engage to get these pollen and nectar sources out there, these host plants, overwintering sites, nesting sites, all these different habitat needs brought into um, the landscapes and the communities where we live and work. So fundamentally, you know, one big thing that we use as a way to kind of galvanize support and bring people together is our Bring Back the Pollinator campaign where we ask people to grow a variety of those pollinator friendly flowers that bloom all through the growing season so to have that pollen and nectar to protect and provide those bee nests that we've talked so much about to avoid using pesticides especially insecticides that are just so targeted right at killing insects uh, particularly potentially our pollinators and then really and this is where I get sort of most excited you know people talking with their neighbors talking with their friends and their family even if it's something very passive like like just putting up a habitat sign. I love habitat signs. If you've got some wild, crazy garden and you're worried about, oh, people worried about it or complaining, oh, it looks like a weed patch or it's overgrown, you know, you mow a nice edge on it, you put a sign on it and people go, oh, that's pollinator habitat. And it's a way to engage, you know, people who are walking by or driving by and help people understand what you're doing. And you don't even have to talk to anybody. It's just part of being in that community and sharing those ideas. Um, and so you could go to our website and take the pollinator, bring back the pollinators pledge. We've got thousands and thousands of people all across the country. Each of those pins is, you know, at least one person who's taken the pledge and said, yeah, my yard, my garden, my farm, um, my park, whatever it might be, um, is implementing or putting pollinator habitat on the ground. And we're doing our part to create habitat and tell people about it. And so for me, just, you know, it's kind of to wrap up on a personal note, you know, part of what's been fun for me in this context of like, you know, pollinator gardens and engaging the public, um, for me, pollinator like habitat has become this really personal thing. I mean, obviously I'm totally into it. I think pollinators are fascinating. They're totally interesting animals. Um, but I worked with my mom, that's my mom right there, um, you know, several years ago to create a pollinator garden where she lives on the East Coast. So I'm based here in Portland, Oregon on the West Coast. She lives in Massachusetts on the East Coast. You know, it's we're thousands of miles apart. And when she planted that garden, and for that, particularly that first year, started to go out and see all these different pollinators, all these different bees, it was a way for us to connect. She would call me up on the weekend, oh, Mace, I saw this bright green bee, or there were th hundreds of bumblebees, or the Joe Pie weed was just covered. I mean, she was really excited, and it was this thing for us to talk about and share about, and then I'd go back, and I'd help add some plants, or you know, do some weeding, or whatever it might be. So it became a way for her and I to connect all the way across the country. So in that same way that like, I've been able to connect with my mom and what she's doing on her garden, this is something that all of us can be doing just in our own neighborhoods, maybe with our friends and family, where you can be sharing all the different layers of life that come when you create pollinator habitat. It's not just a beautiful garden with beautiful flowers, but when you look closely, you see all of this added life, all these pollinators, this wildlife um, that you can be attracting and then helping your neighbors to see and recognize and get excited about. So with that, I just want to thank all of you so much for your interest, for your engagement, for your participation, um, for your own enthusiasm and excitement about pollinators. And I hope that these slides and that this presentation was helpful and that we're able to get you everything that you all need to be able to do great work yourselves. So thanks so much and yeah, take care.